Well, dear Michel, dear John, it's always difficult to debate with your chair, of course, but since I'm a runner, I will try to be up to the job. And I would like to have my slides now up here, if possible. I know you enjoy the break, but we are not quite there yet. First of all, these are my disclosures. Everything you've been hearing from Jordan, first of all, was right. There is no doubt about that. But um, I would like to really clarify the situation we're talking about. And we're talking about surgery in curative intent with adjuvant treatment. I'm not talking about borderline resectable tumors or locally advanced disease because I think we shouldn't muddy the waters. So, adjuvant treatment is still standard after resection and the standard is indeed getting better as you see here. In combination chemotherapy, these are the data from the SPAC4 trial, gemcitabine plus uh, capecitabine did improve the outcome and we're now at 28 months in median overall survival. And when you remember the figures you've been just seeing from Jordan in the neoadjuvant trials, and I will show you some examples as well, do remember whether you see anything beyond 30 months. And the five-year overall survival, and this is actually, from my point of view, even the more important figure, also improved to now 29%. And this is something we still have to prove in the neoadjuvant setting. This might get even better. This is the just published trial with S1 from the Japanese group. Oh, unfortunately, we only have data now from the Jap uh, from an Asian po uh, population, not from a Western population. But here you have a fantastic five-year overall survival rate of 44%, which is really uh, tremendous. Of course, these data have to be reproduced in a Caucasian population to really assess the value for our patients. And there is more to come. You see there is in the adjuvant setting, there is gemcitabine plus napaclitaxel, and there are two trials, one from France and one from Italy, examining fulfinox in the adjuvant setting. So the adjuvant setting is something we still must not forget. What are the problems that need to be assessed? Why are we thinking about new adjuvant treatment? Of course, we want to improve outcome in poor-grade tumors, and this is what you see in the upper left. Grading is important for prognosis. We want to improve the outcome in stage three, which is still pretty bad, and this is the majority of patients we resect. We want to tackle early micrometastasis, and as you see here, this is for the first time that uh, we see data in stage 4 disease, and in the SPAC trial, this is the gray curve on the upper right side, you see that there are patients in stage 4 disease that have been operated on. And of course, we want to improve the rate of our zero resections, but this SPAC is actually might, might be a bad example for our zero resections because they're using the um, Royal College of Pathology classification, which defines anything within one millimeter of the definite margin of resection as an R1 resection. This is not UICC. UICC would classify that still as R0. So we're mixing up classifications, and sometimes we don't know where we really are when we're talking about R0, which is a bit unfortunate. So there might be a point in improving R0 resections, because what ESPEC shows is that combination chemotherapy does fare obviously a little bit worse when patients are actually presenting with positive resection margins, as you see here. So there is a point in downsizing, if downsizing is really efficient. And all these points I've been pointing out to you, of course, what we at the end of the day want to do. We don't want only to improve resection margins. We don't want to have more response rates. We want to have better survival of patients. And this is the question, does neoadjuvant treatment achieve this at this moment in time? These are three meta-analyses, some of them we've already seen from Jordan's data, and they're actually using a mixed bag, a gemisch, as Jordan put it, of trials, some actually in single-arm trials, some randomized trials, some with radiation, some actually including borderlines, some clearly resectable patients, so it's a very difficult situation. But what are the conclusions from these trials, using the older regimens, of course? And Drulli says, marginal support for neoadjuvant chemotherapy in resectable, different for locally advanced and for borderline. Maru Murasifi says, well, there is until more effective agents are available, only patients with locally advanced disease are likely to benefit from neoadjuvant chemotherapy in pancreatic cancer. And Gillen, this is the most ex uh, extensive uh, meta-analysis. You can also argue this is the worst because you, uh, they included trials that shouldn't have been included, maybe. 111 studies, but they come up with the idea that for initially resectable tumors, resection rates and survival are comparable with neoadjuvant chemotherapy versus upfront surgery plus adjuvant chemotherapy. So no benefit, only, again, borderline and locally advanced disease that should be treated. So when we look at the data in a little bit more detail, what are the response rates with neoadjuvant chemotherapy? What you see there is fairly 
there's hardly any complete response. So you have partial responses and up to 30%. Uh, percent. What are the serial resection rates? Okay, to 82 up to 90%, but these were resectable patients anyway. So what about median survival? And this is at best 30 months. I showed you 29 months now with adjuvant treatment in the ASPAC-4 trial. This is not much better, definitely. And these are selected patients going into a neoadjuvant study. These are not randomized trials. But again, what do we see? We do see progressive disease in around about 21% of patients, and this is also something we have to remember. What about gemcitabine plus napaclitaxel? Going to, moving to a bit more advanced protocols. Now, the resection rate is 75%, resectable patients, bearing in mind, and the R0 resection rate, and this is, again, looking at different classification, UICC, 83%, uh, Royal College of Pathologists, 50% margin. So it's these 50% are not worse than the 60%, again, same classification in the SPAC-4 trial. So are we really achieving so much more nowadays using these protocols in the neoadjuvant setting? This is a poster from the recent ASCO using Folfirinox. And this is from the Chicago group. I put it a little bit larger that you, it makes it a, more easy to see. Four cycles Folfirinox, 21 patients. Overall response rate, 20%. This is not really overwhelming, 20% response rate. R0 resections, 94%, but only 80% of the patients made it to resection, 17 out of 21. Pathological response, 59%, but path CR, and this is what we're really aiming at, 6% with the best available protocol. Liver metastasis at surgery, 15%. These have been heavily pretreated patients with the best we have at the moment, 15% of patients present with liver metastasis. This is pancreatic cancer. Median overall survival, 33 months. This is what Jordan already showed to you, but this is not so much better selected patients as compared to a phase three randomized trial with 29 months. And grade three, four toxicity, 50% preoperatively. When we so do a cross-trial comparison, which of course is odd because, for, the, for example, a zero resection rate you can't judge, but this may be improved. We don't have randomized trials. We have a problem with classifications to really compare the trials, but we have up to 20% progressive disease, even with very efficient protocols. And the median overall survival goes up to 33 months, but this is phase one, two, as compared to phase three of 29 months. Uh, do we really do better with neoadjuvant treatment? And the question is, and this has been already raised by Jordan, up to 20% of patients have progressed during neoadjuvant treatment, and this might be a window of opportunity to learn the tumor biology, but this might also be a miss of a potential chance of cure, bearing in mind that not only there is local progress, but there are also distant metastases. There's also a prerequisite for neoadjuvant treatment, and you need tissue, no meat, no treat. And the meta-analysis suggests to you that this is actually perfectly well organized, and uh, endoscopic ultrasound-based biopsies do fare really well with respect to diagnosis. This is a sensitivity and specificity in ROC curve, which is fantastic. Reality is, and this is from our own trial in neoadjuvant setting, in up to 25% of cases, even highly specialized centers fail to get material which we would need to actually start chemotherapy, neither for histology nor for cytology. This is a slide from Ramon Salazar, the ASCO Educational, and they were uh, looking at the value of liquid biopsies, circulating tumor DNA in pancreatic cancer that may replace tissue. It might make our life easier, but as you see here, in contrast to colorectal cancer, for pancreatic cancer, the concordance between plasma, serum, and tumor is not so good. It's 32% in this particular trial, so we need to be a little bit better, and I think so far, liquid biopsies are not yet fit to replace tissue analysis to actually make a decision whether a patient can undergo new adjuvant intensified chemotherapy. So on the other hand, we have toxicity. We may confer benefit to some patients, but we will definitely confer toxicity to all the patients, that's for sure. And grade three, four toxicity is higher with the adjuvant, with adjuvant treatment, of course. But to be honest, higher morbidity and mortality is only seen in patients with, with borderline resectable or locally advanced disease. Of course, more intense protocols like Folferinox have higher toxicity. I've shown it a 50% in the Chicago trial in grade three, four toxicity but I think toxicity is manageable. So this is not an issue that will prevent us from doing that. So, there, but there are uncertainties, and already it's been pointed out by Jordan, I think they are relevant. Which regimen to choose? Folferinox, Gem plus Abraxane, Aver. For how long? Two, three, four cycles, more cycles. Is the postoperative treatment needed at all? 
and which tumor type benefits. And you've seen uh, before the very nice subtyping we have now, the squamous, the adic, the progenitor, the immunogenic, which of these subtypes benefits and which doesn't? And we need to find that out. And there will be no one size fits all, I suppose, and we need good randomized trials, and there are good randomized trials, and these are the trials with GEM plus nacopaclitaxel, these are the trials with fulfirinox. So there's a lot of trials you can actually recruit patients into. And this is, I think, and this is where I conclude, is it justified to move from adjuvant to new adjuvant treatment? I think not yet as a clinical standard. This may or will even have benefit to some patients, but not to all patients. And I think we have to establish the best tool to establish diagnosis, maybe this is liquid biopsies. We will have to establish the optimal protocol and schedule for new adjuvant treatment, what to do, how much, and for how long we do chemotherapy. We need to establish, do we do pre- and post-surgery treatment, and what is the optimal molecular setting, which patient benefits most from the, uh, from the tumor modality. So we will have to establish, in, in a nutshell, the best value to risk ratio for our patients, and then I think we will have a good treatment. Thank you very much for your attention.